Well, thank you very much, Max, and I prefer to be called Peter rather than Lord, uh, if you don't mind. And it's a great privilege for me to be here, and thank you for spending your, for, uh, your evening here as well. Uh, I noted before coming in that there was a concern that there might be some disruption of the lecture. I think you've been having a few things like that over the last uh, period. That took me back to my youth when I was usually the person doing the disrupting. <laughs> And actually, at that time, it would have been treasonable for UCT to invite me to address you. And uh, there was a time also when the editor of the Sunday Express in London described me in these terms. He said, it would be a mercy for humanity if this unpleasant little creep were to fall into a sewage tank up to his ankles, head first. <laughs> um, I thought there might be some claps at that, actually. <laughs> and, it, you know, this relationship with South Africa, when I came back as the only British minister for Africa in the Tony Blair government to be born in Africa, I visited my old school, Pretoria Boys High, and there was some graffiti painted on the pavement, on the road outside, on the tarmac, saying, Hain, go home. <laughs> and actually, that's exactly what used to be said of me during the Stop the Tour campaigns, Hain, go home to South Africa, and stop causing trouble over there. Anyway, that's not the theme of my speech here this evening, uh, and I'm grateful to, to Max uh, for inviting me. In the space of a year, politics in the old democracies of Europe and the United States of America have been turned upside down. In poll after poll, voters have sprung a series of surprises, plunging both leaders and led into similar states of shock. Brexit happened when it shouldn't have. Trump happened when he shouldn't have. Macron happened when he shouldn't have. And Labour under Jeremy Corbyn delivered a political Dunkirk instead of the devastating defeat that everyone expected, turning Prime Minister Theresa May from heading for a landslide into a dead woman walking, in the words of her former Conservative Chancellor and Cabinet colleague, George Osborne. Why is this all happening? Two years ago, and Max referred to it, I published a critique of an alternative to neoliberalism which has dominated global economics since at least 1980 and argued that the populist revolts across the globe were because it wasn't working for nine out of 10 people. For 30 years after the Second World War, Keynesian full employment policies combined with welfare state policies delivered economic and social stability, promoting necessary investments and faster economic growth as well as more just, more equal societies, and fewer class differences. But for nearly four decades now, we've suffered from a neoliberal ideology. That is to say, a small government ideology favoring market forces wherever possible and tolerating state regulation only where absolutely necessary. Economic and social inequality has widened massively. Not just the poor, but the middle classes have experienced a relative decline in living standards. While the rich have become super rich, the top 10% have benefited, the top 1% even more so, the top 0.1% stratospherically so, while the rest have fallen behind. And in Capital in the 21st century, Thomas Piketty showed that since neoliberalism was adopted, from around 1980, capitalism has reverted to type with an inbuilt tendency to generate shocking degrees of wealth and income inequality, which he predicts will continue throughout the century without major changes in government policy. When Emmanuel Macron won the French presidency in May with an entirely new party, a new movement, the two parties of the centre-right and the center-left were humiliated, and the far-right Trump 
and Putin fan Marine Le Pen came second with over a third of the vote. Launching her presidential campaign, Marine Le Pen promised to put France first by freeing it from what she labeled the tyrannies of globalization and Islamic fundamentalism and the European Union. In a revealing tyrannies, in a revealing insight into a hard right ideology which attracted former working class socialist and communist party voters, she said, and I quote, the divide is no longer between the left and the right, but between the patriots and the globalists. She added, and I quote, financial globalization and is Islamist globalization are helping each other out. These two ideologies aim to bring France to its knees. But at least some powerful global leaders have acknowledged their culpability in opening the door to such malevolent and reactionary views. Last January, the head of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, called for urgent action to tackle what she called a middle-class crisis hitting working people. She warned that inequality, distrust, and a lack of hope were fueling growing populism. Lagarde conceded there was growing inequality, evident from a 2017 Oxfam report showing that just eight Eight billionaires own the same amount of wealth as the poorest half the world's population. 3.6 billion people. Eight billionaires equivalent to 3.6 billion people. Last December, Mark Carney, governor of the Bank of England, issued a rallying cry to tackle the causes of what he called a growing sense of isolation and detachment among people who feel left behind by globalization, global trade, and technology. Those forces had favored the superstar and the lucky, he said. And I quote, but what are the frustrated, the frustrated and the frightened? The fundamental challenge is that alongside its great benefits, every technological revolution mercilessly destroys jobs and livelihoods and therefore identities well before new ones emerge, he said. Carney noted that the rise in living standards around the world in recent decades and said technological progress had lifted more than one billion people out of poverty. But he recognized that many citizens in advanced economies were facing heightened uncertainty, lamenting a loss of control, and losing trust in the system. Rather than a new golden era, Globalization, he said, is associated with low wages, insecure employment, stateless corporations, and, shrink and sh striking inequalities. The financial crisis had exposed how banks had been working in what he called a heads I win, tails you lose bubble. What admissions from these two high priests of global financial capitalism the head of the International Monetary Fund and the head of the Bank of England. Although globalization has been good for many, it has also been grim for far too many. In America and Britain, those who have lost out have tended to be clustered in what were once towns based on heavy industry, which have seen their economic vitality vanish and their self-respect suffer as coal mines, shipyards, steel mills, clothing and textile factories, and heavy engineering plants have been hit hard. In direct response, President Donald Trump's election campaign conjured vivid ideas of a Western Shangri-La for a working class white American males, complete with shotguns, stars and stripes, and of course, Stepford wives. <laughs> He held out the prospect of returning America to the good old days. Coal mines would be profitable in Pennsylvania, steel plants would pay their way in Ohio, and no manufacturing jobs would be in jeopardy anywhere in America's rust belt. Above all, Trump appealed to Americans who felt left behind by globalization and technological change. 
But in the advanced economies of the Western world, it is more austerity and slow growth than globalization, which has squeezed living standards since the global financial crisis. The painful truth is that Donald Trump's victory came as an overdue wake-up call to both conventional politics and orthodox economics. Like Brexit, it injected urgency into pleas for help from communities left behind by globalization and free trade agreements. But although they might be helped by his plans for massive public infrastructure investment building the wall uh, between the US and, uh, and Mexico, for example, his plans to deregulate banking and cut corporation taxes will mainly help the rich and the powerful. Apart from his shocking ban on Muslims, Trump immediately repealed laws that had prevented coal companies from polluting freshwater streams and stopped US corporations from secretly paying foreign governments for mineral extraction rights. He appealed, repealed those two laws. He also attacked the United Nations, NATO, the European Union, and reneged on the climate change agreement in a rage against globalization and its international government, governmental institutions, which has characterized the modern right the world over. The first age, age of, glo of globalization was symbolized in the 1870s by the magnificent 19th century sailing ship Cutty Sark which brought tea from Shanghai to London via the Cape of Good Hope, carrying mainly manufactured goods on its return leg. But Britain now ships far more manufactured products from China than she does to it. Just 20 years ago, China was a minor trading partner in world markets. Today, she is the mega trader having overtaken the US as the world's leading supplier of merchandise exports. China's share of world manufacturing exports rose spectacularly by 10 times over just 20 years, from 1.9% 1 in 1990 to 18.8% .8 in 2013. By 2030, China's share of such exports is forecast to be double that of the United States, four times that of Germany, and 10 times that of the United Kingdom. The Cutty Sark was quickly put out of business in the tea trade by technological change, the Suez Canal and the steamships. Trade has often been blamed for pain that is more due to technological change. And that is where today's questions about globalization begin. In around 25 years since the 1990s, global trade in goods and services has written, risen to unprecedented levels, with exports nearly doubling from some 19% of world GDP in the early 1990s to 33% of world GDP today. We now live in what economists call an era of hyper-globalization. World trade grew at a rate of 6% per year between 1980 and 2008, the beginning of the financial crisis. Helped by the end of the Cold War and the reintegration into the world economic system of the countries of Soviet Eastern Europe, by China's re-entry after her post-1978 economic reforms, by India following her reforms in the early 1990s, and by the spread of democracy in parts of Africa and South America. In economist Stephen Roach's phrase, markets economics has circumnavigated the world. And much of that has been positive. But just look at London's answer to Manhattan, Canary Wharf, alongside the River Thames with its international banks, high-rise office blocks, and expensive luxury flats. The British epicenter of the neoliberal ideology that led to the 2008 global financial crisis, and the principal beneficiaries from the ensuing multi-billion taxpayer-funded bank bailout. Vast glass towers now stand on the site where the London docks used to employ tens of thousands before they finally closed 
1980. Yet the shiny modern buildings of Canary Wharf overlooked next door working class poplar in the London borough of Tower Hamlets, the third most deprived area in Britain, with the highest level of child poverty in London and with over a third of its children living in out of work families. There in mic microcosm are the two faces of globalization, new technology and new jobs alongside abandonment and unemployment. Finance dominant with investment banks alongside poverty and food banks. Stratospheric rewards for a few alongside meager pickings for the many. Winners alongside casualties of globalization. Freeing up international trade by cutting import tariffs and removing non-tariff barriers to trade was supposed to boost the global economy, raise rail incomes all around, and improve living standards across the board. But political leaders and economists have oversold the upside potential of globalization and understated the downside risk, as American Nobel economist Paul Krugman has demonstrated. Although everyone may have benefited from lower priced imports, for many skilled and unskilled manual workers, these gains have been wiped out by job losses in industries that cannot compete with their new foreign rivals. But recent research suggests that things changed in the age of hyperglobalization, and the China shock, the serious adjustment costs caused by China's reintegration into the world economy. Economist Dan, Danny Roderick argues that the net gains from trade now look rather paltry compared with the redistribution of income from lower to higher earners that it causes. Senior British financial and business guru Adair Turner has commented, while trade liberalization from 1950 to 2000 helped drive global growth, the marginal benefits of further liberalization are small. In my view, voters will continue to revolt against further globalization unless radical steps are taken to see that any gains are fairly shared. Very recently, leading economist Branko Milanovic has presented startling results on the effects of globalization on the distribution of income around the world. Between 1970 and 1990, Real per capita incomes rose at similar rates from the bottom to the top of the world income distribution. But over the period 1988 to 2008, when hyperglobalization and neoliberalism really took off, the picture changed dramatically. The first big winners were the fifth of the world's population near the middle of the income distribution. They enjoyed real rapid income growth reaching nearly 80% of the peak. This represents the, the rise of the global middle class in China and resurgent Asia, including India, Thailand, Vietnam, and Indonesia. The second big winners were the top 1% of the world income distribution, the global elite, mainly in the US, Western Europe, but also in countries like Japan, China, India, Russia, Brazil, and indeed South Africa. Christopher Kutama of the Oxford Martin School has summed up what higher trade and higher incomes in the past two decades have led to, and I quote, when the Berlin Wall fell, two-fifths of humanity lived in extreme poverty. Now it's one-eighth. Global illiteracy has dropped one, from one-half to one-sixth in the same span of time. With a few tragic exceptions, a child born almost anywhere today can expect to grow up healthier, wealthier, and smarter than at any time in history. But the big losers were the hundreds of millions who experienced very slow, indeed close to zero, real income growth over 20 years. These are the working class and lower middle class of the rich OECD countries, suffering from a trend that has become even stronger after the 2008 global financial crisis. Globalization has helped turn shipyards into scrapyards, 
clothing factories into call centers, and car assembly plants into car parks. While many secure and well-paid full-time job jobs, where many secure and well-paid full-time jobs used to exist, too, now we, too often now we see only a few, a few insecure and poorly paid part-time jobs. The gains from free trade have not been shared fairly. Paul Krugman in 2008 concluded that the rise in manufactured imports from developing countries like China had led to greater inequality in the US and other developed countries. On top of that, where the last technological revolution first wiped out well-paid working class jobs in manufacturing, the new one could wipe out well-paid jobs in the service sector, many highly skilled from legal assistance to translators. But low-paid workers in the services, jobs like cleaning, gardening, caring, bar or restaurant staff will still be needed. With digitalization, robotics, and artificial intelligence, the super creative minority will be richly rewarded. But there'll be a further hollowing out of the middle class and an expansion of low paid, insecure jobs at the bottom, sharply exacerbating the inequality trends of recent times. Most important, the last technological revolution was accompanied by a political consensus which ensured those making the cars, the washing machines, and the television sets could also buy them because of full employment policies, capital controls, progressive income tax, strong trade unions, and decent pensions. Yet today's fa fashion for neoliberal, deregulated, low tax markets and the gig economy means these kinds of protection have been and still are withering away amidst self-employment and job insecurity. The chickens came home to roost in the recent referendum on British membership of the European Union. The country badly split. British voters' decision by 52% to 48%, a catastrophic one in my view, to leave the U European Union represented a rejection of globalization. But behind that failure has been the neoliberal ideology that has dominated the policies of the European Union and its member states since the 1970s and ruled out serious redistribution, exacerbated by harsh and completely counterproductive austerity policies applied notably to Greece, for example. No surprise, surely, that anti-Europe sentiment has also been spreading across the 27 other EU nations. Poland has lurched into right-wing authoritarianism alongside Hungary's bilious xenophobia. Fascist and populist parties have been on the rise everywhere in Europe. Criminal smugglers made a fortune in 2015 from 80 or 100 boats a day crossing the Mediterranean, bringing a million refugees, a third of these children, as part of the biggest movement of people Europe has faced since 1945. By 2016, around 4,000 desperate refugees drowned in the Mediterranean trying to get to Europe. A quarter of a million, mostly Africans, waited in Libya to make the crossing. In response, more walls have been erected around Europe's borders than during the Cold War. Border rules have been destabilized, dividing member states. The European Commission president termed these poly crises. The French Prime Minister said at the beginning of the year that unless Europe gets a grip on the migration crisis, the European project can die, not in decades or years, but very fast, unquote. Why does this all matter to South Africa, to all of you? Because the EU is the world's largest richest markets and the world's largest aid donor. It has spread democracy to former fascist and Soviet states. It is increasingly important diplomatically, for instance, brokering the vital nuclear treaty and rapprochement with Iran. And it has helped bring unprecedented peace and stability to a continent which produced two world wars last century 
and more intonation wars over the centuries than anywhere else in the world. But today, right across Europe, migrants have become the scapegoat, the problem politically toxic, even though their youth and skills, 40% of Syrian refugees are graduates, can boost our aging European societies. The Syria crisis is apocalyptic, a disaster of biblical proportions with over four million refugees. But the second largest group of contemporary refugees into Europe is from Afghanistan. About 20% are Afghans. Others come from Eritrea, Libya, Liberia, Burma, Congo, Iraq, Somalia, Ethiopia, Sudan, Mali, and Bhutan. Of course, modern Europe was born after a terrible war in the Nazi Holocaust, a time of deep austerity with millions of European refugees fleeing, stateless, homeless, starving, and freezing. The people of Europe, Britain included, were saved because governments accepted the moral responsibility for all peoples, allies and ex-enemies alike. We acted together empowered by the generosity of the US via the Marshall Plan, and we promoted economic policies which by encouraging economic growth, even while post-war rationing persisted, caused real incomes to rise and brought down debt to GDP ratios from their wartime peak levels. And many of those refugees made distinguished contributions to our societies from medicine and science to business. Now Europe faces another moral crisis as desperate people flee from war, tyranny, and economic misery in the Middle East and North Africa after terrible conflicts partly promoted by disastrous foreign policy failures of the United States, European Union countries. But the current refugee crisis may only be the beginning. As population growth, climate change, Food shortages and droughts continue to combine and trigger mass migration northwards from the southern hemisphere to Europe. The world will require fully 50% more food and water by 2030 and the same amount of extra energy in part to source the extra food and water. International migrants are also a product of globalization opening up unparalleled opportunities and incentives for people to move to seek better lives. 200 million people, the size of Brazil's population, are now on the move globally every year, placing huge strains on every European country's jobs, housing, public services, and race relations. In 1970, the figure was a third of that, 70 million. This integration of states in the Islamic world, unable to manage different ethnic and political differences, and a seemingly impotent international system led by the UN means that these migration trends could be with us for the foreseeable future, provoking great instability in recipient countries. Along with other European governments, austerity has been Britain's preoccupation since the high debt and deficits of the 2007 global 2007-08 uh, global financial crisis. Yet that was barely half Britain's ginormous post-World War debt from defeating Hitler. And what happened after 1945? Instead of cuts and austerity, there was public investment spending on a huge scale as millions of new homes were built, new motorways constructed, the National Health Service developed, and modern public services established. At the same time, and this is the key point, at the same time the debt burden, national debt as a proportion of national income, kept on shrinking for the next 35 years, despite 30 budget deficits and only five surpluses, as GDP grew faster than debt rose. Yet today, UK productivity and skills remain very poor, compared with, for example, France and Germany. Our trade deficit is enormous. Manufacturing continues to contract where Germany expands. Levels of personal debt have been rising to disturbingly high levels. Poverty has increased, and many of the jobs created are low-paid and insecure or on zero-hours contracts. Much of the UK's recovery 
has been based upon rising consumer debt and house values. And the British referendum in June last year has caused consternation globally and triggered a fall in the pound, declining real living standards and a weakening British economy. It was a massive kick at the political class. In post-industrial areas such as former mining communities, like I represented and still live in, many who voted to leave felt that they'd been left behind. The great bulk of British trade, nearly half in total, is with European Union countries, and millions of jobs in the country's prosperity depend on such trade. The European Union's clout, offering a market of 40, 445 million people to the UK's 64 million, with an economy around six times the UK's size, gives it a stronger negotiating hand than the UK alone in negotiating trade deals with the rest of the world. Yet these economic realities were ignored in a popular revolt. Regardless of Britain's relationship with Europe, the future seems likely to be a multi-speed, multi-currency Europe. There are already 19 member states in the Eurozone and nine out. 22 in the Schengen borderless zone and six out. And maybe a new, smaller inner Schengen arising under the refugee crisis. Some countries are integrating more, others like Britain with special opt-outs have been integrating less. All the time the challenges are stark. Migration has to be managed with effective EU-wide EU controls or borders will be sealed. Keynesian growth must replace neoliberal austerity or European democracy, in my view, is threatened. Meanwhile, Britain sails uncertainly into the unknown without its government having a clue as to the destination. The days when countries like Britain thought they could go it alone in the world are long gone. We live now in an increasingly interdependent world, one in which the international trade, overseas investment, global communications, worldwide travel, large-scale migration, transferred technology and cross-border crime are commonplace. One in which we all need partners abroad to help us boost business, create jobs, promote trade, manage migration, protect the environment, tackle terrorism, preserve peace, and defend our interests. That means, in my view, reviving the role of the state acting on behalf of society to promote the common good. Economist Danny Roderick argues rightly that markets and states are complements, not substitutes. That markets expose workers to risk and that state action is needed to bolster the legitimacy of markets by protecting people from the risks and insecurities that markets bring with them. In his new book, Guy Standing said it's a myth that the political and economic changes of the 1970s created free markets. Instead, he argues, globalization has hastened the development of rigged markets dominated by a plutocracy and plutocratic corporations linked to concentrated financial capital that are able to gain increasing amounts of rental income by virtue of their wealth. Meanwhile, wages are stagnating. I would pursue four priorities. First, recognize that trade protectionism only made the Great Depression of the 1930s worse. So press instead for closer cooperation across the globe but either put tackling climate change ahead of signing further trade agreements, or better still, build climate change commitments into those trade agreements, because the likely gains from further globalization aren't that great. Second, instead of Trump's bonfire of blank regulations, reform the financial system to reduce the, the risk, the real risk of a second global credit crunch and the consequential threat of complete economic collapse, like in 2008. The financial system remains a powder keg that could explode again unless governments get a tight regulatory grip, including on the shadow banking sector and hedge funds. Third, abandon the austerity policies that have been holding back economic growth in the UK and the Eurozone since the G20 Toronto Declaration in July 2010. 
Britain began 2017 as the slowest growing of the G7 economies, and UK growth is continuing to slow. Fourth, respond to the clear evidence that regional labor markets adjust agonizingly slowly to shocks by radically strengthening the help provided to those hurt by globalization. That means legislating to close, to close, uh, em, emplo to close employment law and minimum wage loopholes, enabling migrant workers to be paid less, both exploiting them and provoking resentment amongst indigenous workers. It also means investing heavily in safety net policies, such as through unemployment benefits and partial wage insurance for workers displaced into lower paying jobs. Governments need to provide a springboard to new jobs with job counseling, help with retraining and relocation, and wage subsidies for employers hiring displaced workers, as well as boosting regional infrastructure spending to help attract new jobs, expand health investment, and provide more affordable housing. In Scandinavian countries, such strong social safety nets do not undermine their labor markets or their productivity performance, quite the opposite. For instance, they help workers to take jobs that would otherwise have been beyond their reach, free education for all, and skills training for any age, social security for the unemployed, and systems of care for children, the elderly and vulnerable members of society add up to what Scandinavians call flexicurity based labor markets. Flexicurity based labor markets. That is their key defense against the worst effects of globalization and open markets. Significantly, Scandinavian countries head the World Economic Forum's Inclusive Development Index. At the top, are countries with higher taxes, generous welfare systems, and stronger, more influential trade unions. The top seven are Norway, Luxembourg, Switzerland, Iceland, Denmark, Sweden, and the Netherlands. Britain and the US are way back in 21st and 23rd places, respectively. And the kind of deregulated free market low tax future that hard Brexit Britain now faces is likely to make this even worse. There's plenty of potential for government intervention to help older industrial centers to thrive as hotbeds of innovation and advanced manufacturing. We cannot afford to turn our back on globalization. But unless we find ways to share the gains fairly, and ensure that the inevitable casualties are supported into taking new opportunities, people as they did over Brexit and Trump will declare a plague on all your houses and walk away from free trade, simultaneously scapegoating sections of our communities, notably Muslims. Our aim must be to give citizens the greater control they have demanded as they turn their backs on the political class, too often attracted by right-wing populist demagogues. Greater control, not protectionism, which would damage prosperity and feed xenophobia, but by ensuring government invests in new technology and retraining to replace old industrial jobs, ensures that immigration is not only focused upon high value added or vacant jobs, which cannot be filled domestically, but crucially also does not replace domestic jobs by undercutting wages and conditions. Above all, such greater control, in my view, means overturning the neoliberal obsession with austerity and shrinking the state. Thank you very much.